Well, hello everybody, Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. I gotta get some music or something in there. Maybe someday we will. Before we get into today's content, just wanna thank you for all the kind and encouraging words. Uh, many of you have said, you know, keep going, we're enjoying these videos, um, that they're easy to understand. That is definitely uh, my goal. It doesn't help to, to have some knowledge, whatever knowledge I, I have, without me being able to explain it in a way that's helpful to you. So I'm, I'm trying to be really intentional about that and just keeping on a topic or two at a time, um, not going over too many scripture passages all at once so that it's something you can follow along with. And I just want to encourage you to share this with other people, not only share the videos, but but share this way of presenting things if it's helpful to you. Or maybe I'll have an idea somewhere that will ignite um, something in, in your mind as a way to present this. But this is obviously, uh, I'm guessing most of you watching any of these videos did not start out as a preterist, did not start out with the understanding of fulfilled eschatology. And so that means you know, as, as well as I know, what a huge paradigm shift this would be. Or for my Australian friends, a peridium shift. They say a lot of things, they spell wrong too. I've got some preterists I know in Australia, so I'm giving them a bad time. But at any rate, um, it is a huge shift. And so we want to do everything we can to make it as simple as possible for people to move from where they are towards this position if, if they're interested and if they're asking questions. And so this is number three of a series called Why We Believe What We Believe. And when I say why we believe what we believe, I'm talking largely about the dispensational paradigm because that's where we started. In other words, why, why did we have these assumptions? Why did we have all these presuppositions? Why did we believe what we believed initially about biblical eschatology? Because sometimes knowing that can help us move from there to to here, or at least begin being good Beridians and have a better hermeneutic, a better, a better set of lenses in which to study the Bible. So in that first video, and I would encourage you to go back to the first and second videos if you haven't watched them again, the series is called Why We Believe What We Believe. Uh, number one was a little bit of an introduction to dispensationalism itself, and so I won't go over too much of that here, and I focus primarily on the, the rapture teaching as it's commonly held and looked at some scriptures there that are often used to bolster that position and why I don't think those scriptures actually do that. In the second video, we talked a little bit about the, the millennial kingdom and about how we end up, if, if we interpret that as a literal thousand year period, especially from the dispensational perspective, we end up with some odd uh, things. We, we have basically, a, um, you know, in the rapture, we had first a secret coming, then an actual coming, which really makes three comings or appearings of Christ. In the millennium, you have a judgment before, you have a judgment after you have a lot of different ideas about what's happening during that millennial period. Do you have glorified saints living with unglorified saints? There are, there are a lot of just very confusing things there. Well, we're moving towards the nation of Israel, which is is huge and, and also um, an, another area where one can get themselves in big trouble. I mean, it's, it's a minefield for sure. And, and long before I came to preterism, when I came in the more reformed view, of the nation of Israel, I'm already, um, I got a lot of heat from that and was already called a false teacher and even a heretic a couple times simply for believing of that. And so Israel is, is huge when we look at this, but we've got to do just a little bit of work to get um, to the particular things I want to mention about the nation of Israel. So I'm going to start off with a scripture I shared last time, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And you may want to have your Bible to follow along or write down these references. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, this is the King, uh, New King James Version, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Glory, hallelujah, and a stinking man. What a wonderful text. And what's so incredible about that text is Peter is applying it to believers. And way back in Exodus, Moses had applied it specifically to the nation of Israel, to ethnic Israel. And now, now Peter is saying, you, you believers, and this would have included anybody that, uh, that had a Jewish background and was a believer, and also any Gentiles coming in, you're the real chosen people of God. You're the royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, his special people. And, and a whole mega theme 
throughout the New Testament, which finds its roots in the Old Testament, is this idea that as ethnic Israel was rejecting Yahweh, which they had done time and time again, but it was going to, to lead to sort of this, this zenith, these epic proportions in what we see as this final generation of the nation of Israel, as they were continuing to abandon, as they were continuing uh, to, to worship other gods, to turn from Yahweh, at that same time, the Gentiles were coming in, and the Gentiles coming in were going to make those, those sincere Israelites jealous of that and going to want to make them come back into a nation with Yahweh. And then we have this, this mega theme that is sometimes referred to as the, the regathering, uh, the, the marriage theme, uh, the resurrection, which, was, which is bringing all these believing Israelites and the Gentiles together to be what's, what Paul calls the Israel of God, uh, the true Israelites, and those were going to be the chosen people of God at that time. And I know I just said a lot there in a little bit of space, but it's, it's a huge um, theme that is so often missed when we don't understand how the covenants work. And so as we head in a little more specifically to the nation of Israel, I'm not sure how much we're going to get to that in this video, but we need to do a little work thinking about what Peter just said, who those chosen people were, and we need to move into a, a very, very important text from from Hebrews because it clears up a lot of this confusion about how covenants work. And the reason this is so important is because the Old Covenant was made specifically with ethnic Israel, that nation of Israelites. And there are a lot of people today, um, not only dispensationalists, but in a different way, even people that hold to the ah-mill eschatological position, even those who are post-mill in their eschatology, still see some future purpose for the nation of Israel. And again, dispensationalism has something that, that's a very different kind of unique purpose. But the, the point is that when we understand that that old covenant with Israel, that that completely went away, and that was talked about in Hebrews, and we'll get there for a second, we realize that there, there is, biblically, the way I understand it, there, there simply is no future for ethnic Israel. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean at all that there aren't people now who happen to live in, in the land that we call Israel, that nation, that are going to come to Christ. I'm not saying that, but there is no unique relationship anymore between Yahweh and ethnic Israel. Israel. Um, Yahweh is a God for, for everyone, and anyone who comes to Christ um, also comes into a relationship with Him. Okay, I hope, I know that's a, that's a lot to go over there, but I think this passage from, from Hebrews will really help. And so let's, let's go there. We're going to Hebrews 8. Verse 13 is, is the really important verse there. Hebrews 8, 13. But I want to provide a little bit of context, so I'm first going to read verses 7 and 8. Hebrews 8, starting in verse 7. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Okay, and we see that predicted all throughout the Old Testament, you know, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Hosea, and other, other places. And along with that is this theme of, of divorce, that first the nation of Israel was going to be divorced and later Judah, but there was going to be this new bride. Again, this new bride was, to, was going to comprise of the true believing Israelites and the Gentiles coming in, the one new humanity who Paul spoke of in Ephesians 2, a text we focused on quite a bit in one of the previous videos in this series. So let me now read verse uh, 13, Hebrews 8, 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. Now listen very carefully to this language and the tense of this language as we go on. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Verse 13 again, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Okay, Hebrews 8, verse 13. Such an important verse. And by the way, let me mention a resource here uh, that you may not expect. This is a, a pastor that um, takes a lot of heat. He's got uh, a, a church that, at least at, uh, when I've looked at it in the past a little bit, the second largest church in the United States, and that may have, you know, that may have changed. But Andy Stanley, who pastors North Point Church in Alpharetta, Georgia, um, at, at a church I previously did music for, I was privileged to do some conferences with the other staff, and uh, they, they were a blast, and the, and the church was just so kind to fund, to fund those things. But I got to go there a couple of times, and... Um, 
for those of you who may be watching the same, what? Master Joel isn't Andy Stanley? Um, look, first of all, I've learned a lot from a variety of different pastors. You know, it is okay. It is okay to agree with 60% of what somebody says and not the other 40%. It's okay to agree with 40% and not the other 60%. We really can learn from a variety of whether you want to call them camps or tribes or what have you, if we're willing to do that. And I would suggest that. Sometimes, even in the preterist community, we, we, we pigeonhole ourselves and I would never listen to that person or that person and that person and that person. All futurists are bad and evil and, and you know, stop it. Stop it. There is a lot to be learned. And, and what I want to mention, that Andy Stanley, in his in his book, and I, I can't remember the title of the book right now. Um, dang it, that doesn't help anybody. Um, but, but it's something about, <laughs> it's just something about Jesus. <laughs> um, but about how he came in the first century. I'll, I, I think I may remember it as I go on this video. Sometimes my mind works that way or something close. But anyway, he actually does a really good job with Hebrews 8 and this and this text, and that was one of the first times that I had really come to this text. Uh, uh, a few years before, I came to preterism, and he's basically saying, it, it, this might be shocking to you, but, but God himself said the Old Covenant is obsolete. Because Stanley in this book is properly pointing out that there is a lot of confusion between covenants and a lot of churches who are still trying to live as if we're under the Old Covenant, as if we were under all of that. And he says, no, that was specifically to the nation of Israel. And God actually said it was obsolete. And he was right. And he did a really good job with that and tracing the history. And the title absolutely is not coming to me. It, what, I, what I'm going to do uh, when I get towards the end of this video, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look that up because I don't want to do it right now. But it's worth looking at. But that was really the first time I had seen that. And I thought, obsolete. And, and sure enough, obsolete. Um, and that's, you know, again, we're, we're stuck in that. What often happens with the Old Covenant is you had the, um, it's, it's parsed into the ceremonial laws, uh, the sacrificial system, and, you know, the, the Ten Commandments or what we might look at as the moral laws, and even in the Reformed community. And again, I, I adhere to, to some of what the Reformed community believes and, and not other things. But, but, but they especially have said, well, we know we're done with the ceremonial laws, we know we don't do animal sacrifices and so forth, but we're, we still have an obligation to the, the moral code of that law. But in Scripture, it's just not parsed that way. The, the whole thing is obsolete. It's, it's done. It's dead. Now, now we have a reason to, to still uh, follow those moral imperatives for, for a couple reasons. First of all, the New Testament writers, other than uh, one commandment, the Sabbath law, uh, reiterated those in some way, shape, or form. But, but more than that, we have what, what's the law of Christ, and, and it's because of our dedication to Christ that's the motivation to. We should be living very, you know, holy and upright moral laws, but because of the law of Christ, not because of the old covenant. And that motivation is really, really different. And the writer of Hebrews, whoever it was, said that that old covenant, the the whole thing, was obsolete and outdated. But it said it will soon. It will soon disappear. Obviously, something that is soon going to disappear has not completely disappeared yet. And there are those even within the preterist community that insist that the Old Covenant passed away at the cross. And it just didn't, unless you want to, and don't argue with me about it, if you're one of those people, you need to argue with the writer of Hebrews. There, and there, all throughout the New Testament, we, we see the writers um, talking about this, you know, when, when Paul talks, for instance, in Romans 13, the night is almost over and the, and the new day is, is coming. What was that night? He's talking about the old covenant. Clearly, it hadn't yet completely disappeared in his mind. It was going away. It was fading away, but it was not yet completely gone. And this is hugely important because in dispensationalism, they will see God as being done with the nation of. Um, no, let me let me let me back up here. I'm sorry. I mean, dispensationalism. One of the things they get right is they attribute all the last days promises to the nation of Israel. They see that connection, but they put this silly you know, gap where the 70th week is coming later. We'll get to that sometime in another video. And so there was a postponement. The prophecy clock stopped ticking when. Uh, when Jesus refused the kingdom, and then Yahweh was like, oh no, what do I do now? I guess I'll have to present it again thousands of years later, and then maybe they'll want, you know, maybe Jesus will then want the literal kingdom that he refused before, which of course is is ridiculous. And I've talked about it in the last video, how I actually think that's blasphemous, the idea of bringing in this, this covenant back again. So dispensationalists get it right in terms of connecting the last day's promises with the nation of Israel, 
but they completely you know miss the the timing of all that and put this false break in the prophecies um amillennial and postmillennialism um sees that God was essentially done with Israel at the cross and there might be some kind of you know, future with Israel where a lot of Israelites at one time um, come to Christ but they kind of disconnect the promises with Israel because they think he was completely done with Israel and, and neither of those paradigms work biblically whereas you have in preterism you combine those things that the promises the last days promises were absolutely connected with the nation of Israel but all that took place including the parousia the return of Christ uh, the judgment the the uh, destruction of the planet language which was of course metaphorical they, the timing on that we have correctly at least in my opinion and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of throwing a lot a lot at you here conceptually that we'll, we'll try to get to a little more um, maybe specifically in some other videos but what I'm talking about essentially is that the, the correct understanding of the covenants how they worked and when the old covenant passed away is essential if we're not only going to hold to the right eschatology but if we're going to have the correct hermeneutic the correct lenses I believe for studying the entire Bible so I open to see this so again the writer of Hebrews is saying this was soon going to disappear most people place the writing of Hebrews around you know, I've seen anywhere from 62 to 65 AD. I'm not a scholar on those matters, but let's throw it somewhere in there. And so this writer is saying, soon, when was it going to disappear? Uh, when Jesus talked about the, the temple falling and all the things he talked about in the Olivet Discourse, these false messiahs were going to, to come. There was going to be pestilence, famines, earthquakes. The gospel was going to be preached to the whole world, which we understand to be the Oikomene, the, uh, the inhabited world, often seen as the Roman Empire at that time and that's when the, the old covenant was finally going to pass away when that temple was destroyed and that's what the he, the author of Hebrews is saying and so with with all that is it's kind of a, a much longer introduction uh, than I planned let me get a little bit more specific and I, I'm 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 reading I'm gonna try to keep my focus on on you there because you look beautiful through the camera but I'm reading now right from uh, my book a book I haven't published yet called seismic shift a pastor's end times trek Lord willing uh, we'll get it out soon. But I'm, I say this. It did, it being the Old Covenant, did disappear, by the way, in AD 70. The Old or First Covenant had a purpose. It was not a mistake, but it had a shelf life. What Christ replaced, dispensational teaching wants to take back off the shelf and reinstate, thereby replacing Christ. Now, I know that's a strong statement, and but essentially, uh, that's what's happening. I know... Um, it sounds strong, but if you do some homework, you'll find out the whole system um, was set up again by John Nelson Darby, the founder of the Plymouth Brethren Church. Now, to be fair, some of the Plymouth Brethren were very against what Darby taught, but some embraced it. His theology, again, was based largely on the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture and the literal thousand-year millennium and so on. And although not everyone agrees, I've seen a couple sources that, uh, that aren't quite sure about this but most of the literature suggests that Darby got this idea from this rapture from a 15 year old Scottish girl named Margaret MacDonald she had some kind of vision and in that vision she saw a certain kind of return of Christ where there is a secret coming first and this provided foundation for the commonly taught modern rapture view this preacher rapture was highly popularized by C.I. Schofield in the Schofield Bible that was the one of the first if not the first Bible that had notes along it like we'd see now we have lots of study Bibles and his notes were largely based on Darby's ideas and unfortunately the notes almost superseded the scriptures for many who read it and Schofield's teaching was then picked up by a well-known Bible teacher um, Lewis Sperry Schaefer and others as well Lewis Sperry Schaefer founded Dallas Theological Seminary that seminary and other seminaries were cranking out pastors who taught this dispensational view because it was the only view they had been taught. Uh, the girl Margaret MacDonald, who in some ways may have been an impetus for a lot of this, um, you know, prior to that time, no one taught anything like what Darby invented. And yes, I say that word invented. And I mentioned this in another video. Sure, you can go back through church history and maybe find bits and pieces of, of some of the dispensational view but the this is again key this 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 strict separation between the nation of Israel and which now people would see as the modern nation of Israel as God's chosen people who are distinct from the church you are just not going to find anything 
quite like that, and you're not going to find anything like the pre-trib rapture view anywhere in the literature and the commentaries before Darby was writing about it. It, it just is not there. While people have held various positions on eschatology, uh, again, no one created this kind of distinction like he did. But the distinction Darby created, listen, this is important, it's necessary in order for the rapture, millennial kingdom, and the two people of God to work. Because again, the idea was that, that rapture, it had a pragmatic purpose, which was to take the church out so then Yahweh could get back to working with his original people, which is kind of what he always wanted to do, do, do all the time. But again, the nation of Israel had kind of thwarted his plans by rejecting Christ. If, if, and again, this is more in traditional dispensational teaching and the uh, more modern dispensationalists, some don't hold of this. But this is how serious this is. According to the traditional dispensational teaching, and God had this plan, and, and, and he, was, he was trying to bring in the kingdom right then, the dispensationalists see as coming future. The idea was Christ was going to bring in this literal geopolitical kingdom right at that time when he came to the earth, and it would have worked fine if, if Israel wouldn't have kind of forced God to change his mind. Do you, do you see how serious this is, this is? Because in that teaching, if it had worked, in other words, if Jesus had brought in this kingdom and Israel would have, would have accepted it, the cross, the crucifixion, never would have happened. Do you understand how, how serious and egregious this, this system is, this system of teaching. Again, I'm not saying the people who believe it. I'm saying the teaching. It makes the cross unnecessary. The cross essentially was plan B. And that's... Okay, and my intention, you know, in, in this book I'm now reading from, and, and just in general, is to try to be a gracious, merciful, to, you know, to give, uh, to, to give a long leash to other ideas that may be different because I've certainly changed my views on many things over the years when reading the Bible. But this is too serious not to be very direct with. I think this criticism is warranted and even necessary because dispensationalism has done great damage to the church and it paints a picture of a future that does not reflect what we find in the Bible. I loved it. You know, I was a, I did an interview recently with a with the boroughs of Berea, which I was so privileged to do. And, and some of you, I put that on my Facebook page. I want to get it attached to um, my YouTube channel too. Just I don't know how to do it. I haven't done it yet. Um, but then we also did a panel discussion. And I just listened to that panel discussion um, when it, cause it, it dropped on um, Thursday, just a couple days ago. And one of the things Rick Welch said in that panel discussion that I just loved, and, he, and he's someone who has you know, publicly come to preterism, he said, I just want to show people the world that they actually live in. Well, praise the Lord. I mean, it couldn't have been said better. Dispensationalism teaches not only in eschatology, but more than that, because it's a whole way of seeing the Bible. It's a whole certain pair of lenses. It, it teaches not only a false or errant eschatology. It teaches a world that does not exist. You know, Don Preston, you know, who's a friend of mine, and I'm privileged, I've got all kinds of friends in the in this community, and, and I understand some of my friends don't disagree with each other or don't agree with each other, and that's okay. Sometimes preterism is like junior high, like, well, if you follow that person, you can't listen to that person, or that's dangerous, don't go over there. Okay, be careful, be discerning, be a good Berean, but but really we have we have so much commonality and and, and, and so much unity in what we believe. Anyway, but, but Preston often says You've got to catch the power of this. You know, I, I shouldn't even try to say it like him. I can't, could never say it like him. But, but I love it. I mean, do you catch the power of that statement Rick Welch said? I just want to show people the world they actually live in. Dispensationalism creates it, its natural consequences as a worldview that's wrong because it's based on a world that doesn't exist. I mean, this, that's huge. I'm even like, even as I'm saying this, I'm just like, wow, this is, this is really powerful. And so, um, this this video, um, I was going to go a little bit further with this. I'm going to go ahead and and uh, and, uh, and stop this video in just a minute, and, and I'm literally going to start recording another video in the next few minutes so I can keep this train of thought going. But let me just finish. Let me just finish this uh, this thought here. Um, 
one of the reasons I think for dispensationalist success in our culture uh, is that first of all we've just been bombarded with it for well over um, a century. It was picking up steam in the 1800s, but especially in the late 1800s. Then you had C.I. Schofield's Bible that was published, I think, early 1900s. Uh, that really took off. Then you had Lewis Berry Schaefer, Dallas Theological Seminary, all these pastors coming out of that system. Uh, fast forward into the future a little bit. Hal Lindsey writes a book based on this paradigm in 1970 called The Late Great Planet Earth. Sells some 30 million copies. Amazing. I, I've read the book. I mean, it's a, a good writer and it, it's captivating. It just, it's just wrong. Um, and you had all this stuff happening in the Left Behind series, over 70 million copies of the books alone. You put in whatever the movie sales were over there, and you can understand how this had such a great impact. And then you've got, you know, we did have a lot of difficult things happening. You've got a world war, you've got another world war, you've got, you've got the Great Depression, you've got all these things, and you can understand why people thought, you know, this is not, this is not going so well. You know, Jesus, would you please come back and, and fix all this. So I think we can understand why it's been so pervasive. And then finally, and unfortunately, I'm not trying to be me. But I have spent time in, in a, several different church contexts, some small churches, some larger churches, a variety of denominations, you know, different states. And I, and I, and I, I know, you know, obviously I don't uh, have close relationships with all of them, but I, but I know many hundreds, if, if probably not, not thousands of them, of believers, at least people that I've had been privileged to have contact with over, my, over the course of my life, and many you know, wonderful people that are that are studying the scriptures diligently and are really being Bereans, um, but but a lot that aren't, and and that doesn't mean that they don't exemplify a, a good Christ-like character and aren't you know, aren't doing other things, but they're just it's just not something a lot of believers do, and so. All their theology, but I'm focusing on eschatology, it comes much more from what their pastors have taught them, or what their denominations say, or what the creeds iterate, than any studying they've actually done on their own. And so you, you combine all those, and it's very easy to see why people have believed this and, and have just never even questioned it. And that's one of the reasons I think some people get so angry, so angry when you would even question one of the tenets of dispensationalism, and I'll close with this, and then I am going to get the title of, of Andy Stanley's book, because it's a really good treatment of that Hebrews passage, um, and other things as well. But what's happened, and one of the reasons we called heretics, and we're not saved, and we're condemned to hell, and we're false teachers and all that, is because this is another huge problem that, that I've seen, you know, in my opinion, in dispensational teaching. In dispensational teaching, Okay, and these are again the key tenets. The, the rapture as it's commonly taught, the modern view, the millennial kingdom, you know, the, the, the future coming antichrist, um, what would be something else, the, the, certainly the separation of Israel and the church. Those things are not only seen as eschatological issues, they're seen as salvific or salvation issues. Now, I have no idea why, because there's nowhere in the Bible that I can find where salvation is being spoken of. Oh, but uh, 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 you also need to believe the rapture, the millennial kingdom, and this and that and the other. But that's how people are taught it. And so, and that's what started happening to me, even with some close family relationships. When I started questioning the rapture teaching years ago, they didn't think, okay, Joel has a different idea about the rapture. They thought, I'm not sure if Joel is saved. And I'm sure many, and, and we need... Uh, this is something that's serious, and we, we need to be, speak out very strongly against any message of salvation that would have several additives to it that are man-made doctrines and teachings that aren't found in Scripture, because that's dangerous. Okay, so I'm getting excited here. But let me, I'm going to come back to this again in another video so I don't lose my train of thought. In just a minute, this one went just a little bit long, so thank you for your patience. But let me, let me try to grab this really quick. Um, and it's going to take a, just a minute here. Usually I, a title or something will come back to me, and this one absolutely didn't. Because I really think you could, you could benefit from this book. Almost there. Um, it is called... Here we go. Irresistible. Reclaiming the new that Jesus unleashed for the world. Irresistible reclaiming the new that Jesus unleashed for the world. And he does a great job in that book. He, he's got one huge error that, uh, that a lot of people saw and that he took a lot of heat for. Um, 
he talked about unhitching the Old Testament from the New. I think, I really believe what Andy Stanley meant to say, and I saw a couple, he did an interview with Jeff, Jeff Durbin and some others to follow up, and he never said it this way. But if I could speak for him, trying to say what I think he meant, and in this sense he would be 100% correct, is we need to unhitch the Old Covenant from the New. But he said Old Testament from the New, he got himself in lots of trouble. But in that book, he does do a fantastic job of saying that, w that we still hold to so many tenets of the Old Covenant when Jesus brought in the New Covenant and, and uh, God actually said the Old was obsolete. And he's 100% right. So you might want to check out um, that book by Andy Stanley, Irresistible. I'll give it to you one more time. Irresistible, Reclaiming the New that Jesus Unleashed from the World. All right. So I'm a little over time here with where I want to be on these videos anyway. Um, if this content's helpful to you, like, subscribe, um, share it with others. Let's get it out as close as across the street and as far as across the world. Pastor Joel saying bye for now.